was laying on the floor and staring at a pack of M&Ms. And all I had to do was keep my eyes open, and they would be mine. But my parents were torturing me because they were trying to get eye drops into my eyes. Now, if you've ever had a child that you need to give eye drops to, and they don't like eye drops, you know how impossible this is. Because if anybody's going to walk in on you, they're going to think you are abusing your child. As you have them laying on the floor in a headlock with your fingers prying open their eyes. And then the eyelid, I mean, it can just blink really quickly. And I, believe it or not, was not the easiest child to have eye drops put in when I didn't want to have eye drops put in. And so I was like, you're, you're getting them all over my face. And they're like, leave your eye open. And I'm like, it stings. And that's where the M&M's came into play. Like, if you leave your eye open, we'll give you M&M's. But at some point in your life, like, M&M's just don't cut it anymore, right? Like, when you're, when you're two and you're, you're three and you're getting potty trained, yeah, I'll go. Give me an M&M. By the time you hit five or six, you're like, mm, one M&M, been there, done that. Let's go a pack. And so, so the pack was introduced, but at some point in time, you're like, burning in my eyes for a pack of, nah, I'll, I'm good. I don't, I don't need the M&Ms. But I needed the eye drops, but the eye drops really hurt. And I remember my parents getting frustrated, and I was frustrated, and they finally got the one eye drop in the one eye after going through about half the bottle of the eye drops. They finally got one of them in the one eye, and it just really hurt, and it really stung. And I was a giant baby at the time, and I'm sitting there crying, and I remember this. I remember laying on the floor crying and looking up at my parents and saying, why are you doing this to me? And their response was, one day you'll understand. One day you'll understand. And they were right. At the time, I had absolutely no idea why they were putting the eye drops that the doctor had prescribed for them to put in my eye, in my eye. It was obviously to to heal the eye infection that I had and to make it better, but in the process, there was some pain involved. And I didn't understand why they would put me through this. And if you've ever been a parent, you understand that feeling that you have when you see pain in your children. And you have to do something that just, it brings about some temporary pain, but for a greater good, whether it's, whether it's a medicine that they need, whether it's discipline that you have to correct them with, whatever the case may be, as a parent, you know that feeling. And you don't enjoy it, but you know ultimately it's what they need for the long term. And this morning, we're going to conclude our look at prayer, and we're going to talk about something that, quite frankly, I wish we didn't have to talk about. We're going to talk about something that I don't like, and most people don't like, and chances are you don't like it either. But today, we're going to talk about why God answers our prayers in different ways than we want Him to, and why it seems sometimes that God doesn't answer our prayers at all, and why He's distant. And why it feels like in those circumstances and in those instances that he doesn't care. And what's going on? If we could pull back the curtain, what's going on? So if you're just joining us today, we're so glad that you're here. We've been talking about prayer for the last few weeks. And just to catch you up, the first week we saw about the value of persistence in life, but also in prayer. And that there is value in being persistent in prayer. And and then we saw how not to pray. We saw that we don't have to change the inflection of our voice or, or come up with a certain vocabulary. We don't have to get in a certain position. We don't have to make it a routine. But we can just be ourselves and we can pray and we have that freedom through our relationship with Jesus to just be ourselves and enjoy that aspect of prayer. And then we saw how to pray. And we, we looked at the Lord's Prayer, not as, a, not as a manuscript, but rather as a method. And we saw all the different ways that, that we should pray and all the different levels that we can talk to God. And then last week we saw the goodness of God. And that God is a good God. He loves us and He desires to give us good things. And He desires to hear our prayers. But today we land at the point that maybe some of you are experiencing right now in your life. The point of frustration. Maybe you've been praying for something for a really long time, and it makes no sense why God isn't answering this prayer. 
Maybe you've been praying for somebody that you love to, to find a relationship with Jesus, and they haven't. And for the life of you, you will not understand how you can pray that prayer to God and how God would not hear that prayer and answer that prayer. Or maybe it's for a job. You're stuck in a bad situation right now and you've been praying. You need to provide for your family. You understand that need to provide for your family. But you've been praying to, to God to, to intervene and to open up a new door or a new avenue. And, and it's not happening. And you can't understand why you continue to be stuck in a situation that you do not enjoy, or maybe you're out of work, and you're looking around, and you see all the, all the hiring signs, but nothing really fits your passion, and, and, and you just can't discover the, uh, the thing that eludes you so much, and that you want so desperately, or maybe, maybe it's for healing, maybe you find yourself sick, and with a diagnosis that doesn't look promising. And you're crying out to God and you're asking him to heal your body and to make you whole. And you can't understand for the life of you, where is God and, and what's he doing there? Or maybe it's, it's for you or someone you love. And you see their life just spiraling down as addiction continues to take a greater and greater hold of them. And you ask God constantly to deliver them or even yourself from this which holds you down and this which keeps you in chains. And for the life of you, you can't understand why addiction seems to win every single time. And for many people, this is the breaking point. For many people, this is where they throw in the towel. And they just can't fathom, if God is so good, and if God is so loving, then where is God in these times, and where is God in these instances? And so they run away. They throw in the towel. For many, this is the point where they stop believing entirely. And today we're going to look at some different portions of Scripture. And we're going to hopefully provide the answer, not that we're all going to love it or even like it, for why God chooses not to answer all of our prayers in the way we would desire. And so to start, we go back to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 55, and we're going to be all over the place, so if you have your phones or your tablets, we highly encourage you to take those out and to open up the Bible app, and you can follow along with us in the events section there. But if you don't have the Bible apps on your phones or on your tablets, you can follow along on the screens where we read these words from Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Let me read that again. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. What we have to understand is this, that God operates and exists on a level beyond what we can comprehend. We have to embrace the fact that God exists and operates on a level above what we can fully comprehend. We are finite beings, and we have amazing minds, but those minds have a capacity. And in the way that God functions and who God is, is greater than our capacity to fully understand and to fully comprehend. And the reality is this, we oftentimes want to reduce God to becoming on our level. We want to reduce God to operating on our level because we can rationalize something and because it makes sense to us, we want, it to, we want to be able to say, well, then since this makes sense to us and this is how we think the order of things should operate, then God should operate accordingly. And what we do when we think that way is we reduce the greatness of God and we bring God down to our level and we want to reduce God to our level and we see this all the time. We see this all the time in ourselves if we're honest about it. 
When we're upset about something, when we're hurt about something, when we're crying out to God to intervene in a situation like we talked about earlier, and God doesn't, it bothers us for a number of reasons, but I would submit to you the greatest reason it bothers us is because we cannot fathom how a loving, good God would operate in a way that's different than what makes so much sense to us. We see this any time that Scripture contradicts something that we hold to and something that we believe. And rather than align our viewpoint, our flawed viewpoint, with the viewpoint of Scripture, we try to rationalize it, and we try to reason with it. We see this all the time. And the first thing that we have to understand is this. God is greater, and God is bigger. God is greater, and God is bigger. And sometimes it's okay to not like that. Sometimes it's okay just to not like that. God doesn't have to operate according to our understanding. And the fact that you're mad at God, the fact that you're upset about those things, God is not frightened by it. God isn't scared by your dissatisfaction. God isn't in heaven scrolling through the Google reviews and being like, oh, one star because of how I answered that prayer. Really worried what that's going to do for my reputation, all right? So I'm just going to invite you, if you're frustrated at God, if you're mad at God, rather than letting it boil over, rather than throwing in the towel, just own it. Embrace it and work through it. God is not frightened by your dissatisfaction. But understand this, God is greater than you. And there are going to be some times that the thoughts of God and the ways of God operate beyond our ability to comprehend. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, think about that. We can't even fully explore outer space. With all the technology and all the developments we have, we still can't make it to the outer reaches of space. And God says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways greater than your ways. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So the first thing we have to understand is God is bigger. And he doesn't operate according to our understanding. But that's not the only reason that God doesn't answer prayers in the way that, that we would think, or it seems like our prayers are going unanswered. And so next we look at James 4, 2 and 3, where we read these words. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So a couple other reasons that God seems like he's not answering our prayer or God doesn't answer our prayers in the way that we desire him to do so is this. We simply fail to ask. We simply don't ask him. We rely upon ourselves. We rely on our own gifts, our own abilities, our own skill set. And rather than show a healthy dependence upon God, we, we are self-reliant. And rather than even ask God to, to work and to intervene in the situation, we just depend upon ourselves. Where if we would only ask Him, He would give it to us. I was chewing a piece of gum a, a couple days ago. And out of the back seat, I hear, At this point, it's just like kind of a game, all right? I'm probably a bad parenting moment, but at this point, it's just like, how many, how many grunts am I going to get before they finally say something? And then after their silence for a minute, I'm like, all right, I'm just being a bad parent. I'm like, what's up? Can we have some gum? Yeah, no problem. And so I gave them some gum. I didn't know they wanted gum. I had no idea. I was just chewing a piece of gum, driving along. Now, I wasn't necessarily thinking when I put a piece of gum in my mouth, maybe I should turn around and offer, but I was just chewing a piece of gum. 
It's not that I didn't want my kids to have gum. It just wasn't on my radar. As soon as they asked, I had the gum. I turned around, and I gave them the gum. Now, I'm a flawed parent. I get it. I'm a flawed person. God has a much bigger understanding than I do. God knows what we need before we even ask, to ask for it, as we've already seen from other verses. But sometimes, James 4 tells us, we don't have because we just don't ask. And what's our response to that? We get angry. We start to rely upon ourselves, and then it doesn't happen. And we get angry. And then rage and bitterness comes and it fills us up. And it's merely because we never stop to ask. Think about that. And then the other side of the coin is sometimes we ask and we don't have. And the reason that we don't have it is because our motives are all wrong. God sees our hearts. And the most dangerous deception in this world is self-deception. That is the most dangerous deception in the world, and we all can succumb to it very easily because we can rationalize really simply. And self-deception is incredibly dangerous. And maybe the reason that we don't have what we're desperately seeking is because we're asking with the wrong motives and we're asking for the wrong purposes. We continue to yet another reason why God seems like he's not answering our prayers or God's answering our prayers in a way different than what we desire. And this is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, where we read these words. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Let me read this again. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Some of you need to get your cell phones out right now and fire off a text to somebody asking for forgiveness or showing repentance because in about 15 minutes, we're going to be passing the offering plates, all right? So let's get the forgiveness out out of the way so you can give. Check this out. That was a joke, everybody. It's okay, all right? It's a joke. I knew the church just wanted my money. It was a joke, all right? Here's the deal. God views disunity. God views disunity, fighting, and a lack of forgiveness this seriously. God views disunity, fighting, and a lack of forgiveness this seriously. God desperately cares about his people. And he desperately cares about his people operating in healthy community. Because we are the people who have the incredible privilege take the message of Jesus to this world. Not that God needs us, but he chooses to utilize us. And what did Jesus say to his disciples? That this world will know your mind by your love for one another. Here's the deal. At Lakeside, we're not going to agree about everything. We're We're a group of diverse people with diverse passions, with diverse life skills and backgrounds, but we're a community, and we come together to operate as one with the shared value and the shared belief in Jesus. That is what unites us. And that's bigger than any political agenda or political affiliation. It's bigger than where you were born. It's bigger than what team you root for. Yeah, Chicago Bear fans, Viking fans, Lion f- Just kidding, who would root for the Lions? But Bear fans and Viking fans, you are welcome here. You are welcome here. Lion fans, we'll pray for you, all right? But you are welcome here because the cause of Jesus is bigger than anything else. And we're not going to get sidetracked by all the things that, that, can, 
that can divide us. And, and, and here's the deal. This is how important unity is to God. That if you know that there's tension with you and somebody else, you go deal with it before you worship God. Because it's a barrier in your life with your relationship with Jesus. Now, does this mean that every situation and every relationship is going to magically be reconciled? No. In fact, we've talked before that forgiveness is different than reconciliation. But what it does mean is you've got to let go of the grudge and you've got to let go of the hate. So if you know that there's a problem and it's not been forgiven and it's not been discussed, he says, let go of that. Go deal with that problem. Go deal with the disunity. Go deal with the fighting. Go deal with the lack of the forgiveness before you come and worship. One of the reasons that God isn't answering your prayer may very well be that there's tension. And that there's wrongs that need to be forgiven and need to be repented. Because God really cares about his people and how they operate in community. Isaiah 59, 1 through 3 tells us this. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue mutters wickedness. Sin separates us from God. Now Jesus came and he paid the price for our sin. And when Isaiah was written, we were looking forward to that sacrifice of Jesus. And we were looking forward to the hope that Jesus would usher in when he died upon the cross for our sins. And three days later rose again so that our sins could be forgiven. And our relationship with God, whom we have rebelled against, could be restored. And that restoration happens within the work of Jesus. But when there is sin that rules and reigns, In our lives, we are at odds with the holiness of God. And yes, the price of our sin has been paid. And yes, the blood of Jesus covers all sin, past, present, and future. The second you commit your life to Jesus, embracing his sacrifice on your behalf. But the reality is sin always separates from a holy God. And this isn't an issue of your salvation. But what it is, is it's an issue of God's favor in your life. And maybe one of the reasons your prayers are going unanswered or God's answering them in a way that's different than what you desire is because of the output of your life. God is not going to fully bless a life that is lived in defiance to him. This doesn't mean that God isn't willing to forgive your sin time and time again. But God loves you enough that when you fail to submit your life to the standards that he presents, that he will withhold his blessing. And lastly, Mark eleven twenty two to 24 says this. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, Believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And maybe the reason it seems that God isn't answering your prayer, or that God's answering your prayer in a way different than than what you would want and desire, is you just don't have the faith. You 
You just don't have the faith. You've given up. You've thrown in the towel. Yeah, you pray, but it's routine. It's not something that really is, you, is something that you've embraced fully. And it's going through the motions. And the prayer's there because of the discipline, but the faith behind it is empty. And it's lacking. Truly I say to you, whoever says that this mountain be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt it in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. And so maybe there's just a lack of faith. So if your prayers are unanswered, understand that God may have another plan. That you don't ask, really. Or you ask with the wrong motives. That there's disunity or a lack of forgiveness in your life. That sin rules and reigns. Or there's a lack of faith. In January of 2018, I started praying really, really hard. The church I I started with a handful of other people, and I absolutely loved, had hit a really rough path. Not in terms of the mission, not in terms of the people that we had, but in terms of our biggest supporters. And I looked it over and I told Brooke, we're going to give this six more months. But I'm, I'm going to put my name out there and if God opens up a door before that, we'll just see what happens. I don't want to go in. For the next hundred days, I prayed harder for that than probably anything in my life. And God didn't answer my prayers in the way I thought he should. I'm like, what is going on? Where are you? What are you doing? I'm praying for you to... to, To bless a church, like of all the prayer requests, God, you get in the history of time. Like, this should be a no-brainer. This should be a really easy one. What are you doing? I got a call a few days later from a guy who said, Have you ever heard of Algoma, Wisconsin? (laughs) I said, no. There's a church you might want to take a look at. I'm like, nope. It's cold. I don't know where it is, but it's cold. I talked to one of my best friends. He's like, dude, have a conversation. Like, all right. One. And now you're all stuck with me. (laughs) This week, (laughs) you say that now. This week, (laughs) that process took four years off Ray's life, and now he's shouting amen. (laughs) this week my wife and I were talking she said I just feel like we're in a really good place I 
I don't know why God didn't answer those prayers. Here's what I know. I had no idea about Lakeside. I had no idea about each and every one of you. I had no idea about Algoma. I had no idea what God was up to. But sometimes in the heart of us not understanding, we don't get to see the other side. And we don't get to see the future plan that God has. And I can just tell you from my circumstance and my situation, trust Him. Trust Him. It's not going to all make sense at the time. But He has a plan. And it may not be pleasant to walk through. But God isn't going to abandon you. He loves you more than you can fathom. And like a parent, sometimes he has to put his kids through things that aren't pleasant to walk through to accomplish a purpose greater than what they can see. Never question God's love for you. God, I pray that you would help us. I pray that you would help us when we're given answers we don't like. I pray that you would help us when we were given answers we don't understand. God, help us understand that you're bigger than us. That your ways are not our ways and your thoughts are not our thoughts. God, help us end our self-dependency and help us just to ask you, And God, help us search our hearts and our lives for motives. Make sure they're the right motives. God, help us make sure that as far as it is for us, that we live at peace with everyone. And God, that people look at us and they see our love for you by our love for one another. Help us confront sin in our lives. Repent. And strive to do better. And God, help us have faith. In the times it seems you're distant. In the times we don't understand what you're up to. Let us pray with faith and dependency and expectation. God, we love you. Thank you for loving us. And help us make prayer a practice of our lives. Work in us, through us, around us, and in spite of us, we ask. In your son Jesus' name.